like this where it says, okay, how many unique outcomes are there possible for three coin flips? I've got my little coin right here. So I got to go let somebody in. Uh, you know, we talk about, well, it's either heads or tails. I'm hearing things. I thought somebody knocked on the door. It's either heads or tails. So on that first flip, I've got two choices. On the second flip, I've got two choices. On the third flip, I've got two choices. And our fundamental principle of counting says, what do I do with all those twos? Multiply. And we multiply. So if there's two ways for my first event to occur and two ways for my second event to occur and two ways for my third event to occur, then there's eight ways for the conjunction of all three of those events to occur. And if I'm trying to calculate the probability of, hey, what's the probability that I flip a coin three times and it lands on whatever? You know, uh, then I need to be able to count, as Ben said, the whole realm of possibilities. So there's eight ways that this little experiment I have described could, could happen. Now, I'll write brute force up there. Somebody tell me, what does that mean? How can I employ a technique of brute force in counting these ways? Jack? For example, um, heads, heads, heads is a possibility uh, heads heads tails is a possibility heads tails heads is a possibility and then heads tails tails is a possibility so that's four possibilities right and then the other four would be structured similarly. Now, here's the hard part. If we don't think elegantly, if we don't think mathematically, if we don't already know that there are going to be eight, then this brute force approach might break down. I might not think about all of the possible scenarios. OK, um, like tails, 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 heads, tails, heads, tails, and tails, heads. Heads, right? So those are my eight. Brute force makes it to where I can visually see each one of them. Now, here's another drawback of brute force. What if I had said instead of flipping this coin three times, what if I wanted to flip this coin 30 times? <laughs> okay, can you start to see the issue there? I'm not going to want to do heads, 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 brute force would fail me at that point, okay? And I would need more elegant approaches. So um, here's our first example. Let's put this into action. It says, what's the probability that we, in this little experiment of flipping my coin three times, uh, that we land on tails exactly twice, okay? So of this probability ratio, I already know the denominator is eight, okay? We already know that the denominator is eight because with three flips of the coin, uh, there are two times two times two possible outcomes. In other words, eight possible outcomes. Now, as far as the numerator goes, let's think about this. And I know I've got my brute force up there, and I know I could go ahead and say, well, which all of these have exactly two T's in them? And, and there we go, we get our answer, right? But, but pretend like brute force isn't there, because as we just illustrated, brute force won't always be there, okay? How can I think about a scenario like this. Well, the probability of flipping exactly two tails without getting into the weeds here is exactly the same as the probability of flipping exactly one. What? Heads. So the way to count this might be easier to say, well, how many ways is there for me to flip exactly one heads? Well, in this scenario, you would say, oh, well, the heads could occur on the first flip. And then on the second flip, and then perhaps it could occur only on the third flip. In other words, there's three ways for it to happen. Okay. And, and as you get into algebra two and you study more probability, like this is, I'm just telling you all the basics, right? There are more complicated ways. Like what would happen if, you know, if we had five or six coin flips and we didn't want to brute force it, how would we calculate that numerator, right? Uh, and so there's going to be these things called combinations that come into play, permutations that come into play, and you'll make use of some more tools. Right now, the only tool that we have at our disposal is the fundamental principle of counting, which says, hey, if you're trying to have the conjunction of several events, multiply the number of ways that each of those individual events could occur. And that tells you the number of ways that, that all events uh, could occur. OK, now we're going to shift gears just a bit. And we're going to talk about cards. Now, I don't have my deck of cards with me up here at school, but 
But do you guys play games at home? Do you all ever play cards? Has anybody got a favorite card game that they like to play? Which, Texas Hold'em, Jack? Liar, liar. Liar, ooh, I've never heard of Liar, Liar. Sounds fun. Uh, anybody ever played Spoons or Egyptian Rat Screw? Anybody ever played uh, uh, Five Crowns? Okay. So there's a there's a buttload of card games, right? Uh, Slapjack. Ooh, that was one of my favorites as a kid, playing Slapjack. Uh, my dad's favorite card game. Have I told you my dad's favorite card game yet? No? He liked to play this game called 52 Card Pickup. Uh, what are you laughing at? <laughs> okay. Some of y'all have probably played this game as a kid. Uh, so I would come to my dad and say, Daddy, Daddy, I want to play, I want to play. And he'd be like, all right, let's play cards. And I'd like, yay, Daddy wants to play cards. And so he'd be like, all right, we'll play 52 Card Pickup. And I'd say, wow, okay, cool. How does that go? And he'd say, all right. And he'd take the deck of cards and he'd throw it up in the air. They'd go all over the place. And he'd say, all right, pick them up. And that was the game. And I freaking hated that game. That sucked. It was no fun in, at all. Uh, but he, he would always laugh and think it was hilarious. All right. So uh, from my childhood, I have learned that how many cards are in a, a deck of cards? There are 52 cards. All right. Now, that's without jokers. That's in a what's called a standard bridge deck. People used to play bridge all the time. Uh, they would have bridge clubs. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a game where there's four people at a table. And uh, um, it's similar to kind of like hearts or uh, uh, spades, if any of your family members have ever played hearts or spades. It's that kind of game. So a bridge deck, when you see that in a problem, a standard bridge deck has 52 cards, and those 52 cards are, are split up into four suits, what we call four suits. And I might be preaching to the choir here. Like, like Quentin likes to play Texas Hold'em. He knows that there are four suits in a deck. But uh, one year, I, uh, very early on in my career, I, I assumed that everybody knew all about cards, and I started asking these probability questions. And one kid raised his head and said, um, uh, Coach Morgan, what is, what is a face card? And I thought, oh, my goodness, I just assumed everybody knew. So I'm sorry if I'm preaching to the choir here, okay? But I'm going to tell you the basics. A deck of cards has four suits. Two of those suits are black and two of those suits are red. The two black suits are clubs and spades. The two red suits are what? Hearts and diamonds. Okay, very good. In each suit, there are 13 what are called 13 denominations all right we hear that word in uh, the context of money sometimes like in my wallet right now uh, i've got a 10 a 5 and a 1 okay those are three different denominations of bills or you might hear like denominations of churches like a baptist church or a presbyterian church or a catholic church or a, a, pro, a, a methodist church these are different denominations so like in cards a denomination is a different type of card you've got ace Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Jack, Queen, and King. Those are your thirteen denominations per suit. Each suit's got thirteen of those cards. Okay. So, for example, there's four aces. There's four twos. There's four threes. There's four fours. Uh, there's four jacks, queens, kings, so on and so forth. And each, uh, and each suit has one of those denominations. Okay. Now, an ace, depending on the game that you play, aces have different values, don't they? Uh, so, like, when you're playing blackjack, how much is an ace worth in blackjack? One or eleven. Very good. Uh, but in, in other games, it might not be worth one or eleven. Um, you know, I, I play this game called Five Crowns, I think I mentioned, that has uh, a special deck of cards. It's got five suits. Um, but uh, jacks are worth eleven, queens are worth twelve, and kings are worth thirteen. So the, the values of these cards vary depending on, like, different games that we play. But in a standard bridge deck, here's how we um, characterize these cards, okay? These are our numbered cards because, I'm not being a smart aleck, they have a number on them, okay? An ace does not have a number on it. It has a letter. It has an A on it. So a numbered card is 2 through 10. A face card is a card that has a face. It's got a person on there, a jack or a queen or a king. So there's... Uh, three face cards in each suit for a total of 12 face cards in the deck, okay? Does so everybody understand how that works? Any questions about cards whatsoever? Did y'all already know all that? Some of you guys did. Well, if you learned something good. If you didn't, uh, then good too because you've already known it. Now, um, I'm going to ask, example two is, is a little bit of a tough question. So, buckle up. Example two says... What is the probability of randomly selecting a, quote, pair? Joey, what in the world's a pair? Yeah, two of the same denomination, right? Two of the same denomination. So like two jacks or two sevens or two aces or whatever. That's a pair, OK? 
Okay. Now, what's the probability? So imagine I've got my deck of cards, and I really need to get my deck of cards back. I think I lent it out to another math teacher. Uh, suppose I got my deck of cards right here, and I just ran. I let Alex and say, Alex, just draw a phantom out. I say, draw two cards. He draws his two cards, and then I take my deck away, and then Alex looks at them, and he says, oh, I don't have a pair. Okay. So, so like that's the experiment where you're randomly drawing two cards uh, from this deck. Now, I want you to start with the denominator. Okay. I want you to start with the denominator. How many possible ways is there for him to draw out just two random cards? James. Good question, or good, uh, good guess. That's going to start the ball rolling. 52. Paul, you want to uh, add to that? Put your number in front of his number. Two thousand six hundred fifty-two combined together. The two of you got it. I think, if my memory serves me correctly. How in the dump did I get two thousand and six hundred and fifty-two? Right. Well, we've got our fundamental principle of counting that says if I want to do, uh, if I want the conjunction of of a couple of events, I want to count the number of ways that can happen. What do I do with the number of ways each of those events can happen? You multiply them. Now, what are the two events? What did I say that Alex needed to do? He's draw two cards. How many ways, James, is there to draw the one card? 52. And how many ways, now that he has drawn his first card, Andrew, is there now to draw the second card? How many choices does he have? 51. He's got 51 choices. All right. And uh, if my memory serves me correctly, 52 times 51. Is 2,652. That's my denominator. That's the number of possible two card draws that there are in a deck of uh, 52, uh, 52 card bridge deck. Now look, I got to be honest with you. Very often when you guys are studying probability, when you're working a question like this, this is not an easy question. I'm throwing a hard one right at you. Very often we will undercount. You know what I mean by that? We will undercount the number of ways that something can happen. Uh, like we got two answers of like 52 or uh, 26, right? Those were way less than the actual number. Of, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean, okay? So suppose that, suppose that, pick, pick a card, whatever card. So suppose that, that Alex pulled out a 10 of spades to start with, right? How many possible uh, two card draws are there where the first card is a ten of spades? Go back to Andrew's answer. How many of them are there? Andrew, what number did you say that? 51. There are 51 ways that he could say one of my cards is a ten of spades. Because the other card can't be a ten of spades, but it could be any of these other 51 cards, right? So for that one little card, there's 51 ways to do it. Okay, suppose that he doesn't draw a ten of spades. Suppose that he draws a nine of spades on that first draw. Now, for that nine of spades, how many ways is there for him to have uh, a, a two of those cards? Again, another 51. So for each of the 52 cards that he draws in the first hand, there are 51 cards that he could draw in his second hand. Okay, that hits the 52 times the 51. All right. It's the same thing as if I told you how many, uh, let's say I'm going to give Luke a two digit ID number and Luke, you can, you can have, uh, no repeats in your two digit ID number. Okay. Now, how many options does Luke have for his first slot of that ID number? How many digits do we have in our number system? Uh, zero is allowable. So we have 10. We have, he has 10 digits that he could choose from, but he's not allowed to repeat. So once his first identification, uh, a digit of his identification number is selected. Now he has one fewer, so he has nine. So how many uh, possible two-digit combos is there for him? Now, how'd you get 90? Nine. You multiply, and that is our fundamental what? Principle of counting. We multiply. Now let me think, hmm, that's kind of weird because I kind of think there's well, well, how many two-digit uh, ID numbers are possible if, if repeats are allowed? There's 100, because you can have zero and zero. There's 100 possible. 
And yet for our little experiment, we told us, you guys told us our answer was 90. What happened to the missing 10? Or describe those missing 10. What are those? Very good. Zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine. Those are the 10 that we called out and we said, uh, sorry, can't use those. All right, do you see, I told you the other day, I might have told you yesterday, did you, you see how we stink at counting? Right? I, I do. I'm saying we. Counting is hard. So what we've got to do is we've got to think about the tools at our disposal. Fundamental principle counting is a great tool. Now, let's talk about the numerator. Here's where it gets even more challenging. Okay, so here was the denominator in blue. Um, let's do the numerator here in a different color. We'll do the numerator uh, in orange. Now, a pair is where we said there is two of the same denomination. All right, so like let's use our tens as an example. There's a 10 of hearts. There's a 10 of, let me put it over here. There's a 10 of um, uh, diamonds. There's a 10 of spades and a 10 of clubs. Okay. Just with the just with the denomination of a 10, how many possible pairs are there? Could you brute force that? Think about it. Like, like pick me a pair of 10s. Maybe a, uh, the 10 of hearts and the 10 of diamonds. That's one. What else? Maybe the 10 of hearts and the 10 of spades. That's two. The 10 of hearts and the 10 of clubs. That's three. So 10 of hearts is, is uh, exhausted. I can't use him anymore. Uh, maybe 10 of diamonds and 10 of spades. Or 10 of diamonds and 10 of clubs. Now the diamonds are expired uh, or, or uh, exhausted. And then maybe uh, 10 of spades and 10 of clubs. There's six of them. Okay, there's six ways uh, for that to happen. Okay, six uh, uh, pairs, if you will. Okay. Now, again, you'll learn in Algebra 2 sort of the more elegant way of doing this, which I think you guys could wrap your minds around the more elegant way of doing this. Uh, how many how many tens are there in a deck? There's four. So for that first uh, of the pair, there's four options. And then once you've called out a, a ten, now there are, for the second card, there are three. Now, wait a minute, Coach Morgan. Four times three is? 12 and yet you told me the answer is six well we have to divide by two because is a ten of hearts and a ten of diamonds any different than a ten of diamonds and a ten of hearts as far as pairs go and when when, when uh, uh quentin is playing texas hold'em do those do those make a difference the order in which he puts them in his hand no so we wouldn't want to count them too many times hence we divide by two there so four times three divided by two uh it's tricky i know but suffice it to say there's six ways that we could pair up a couple of tens. Now, our tens the only card that we could pair up? Um, no, how many denominations are there? So six times 13, what is six times 13? Six times 13, 78. There's 78 There's 78 possible ways to get a pair of cards in a 52 card bridge deck okay and remember what probability is probability is the number of ways that your event could happen divided by the number of ways that anything could happen now i don't know about you but 78 over um so let me divide 78 over uh 2652 it's about three percent okay uh, let me think here. I want to make sure I haven't messed something up because I feel like I have six times 13. There's six possible ways to do that. There's 13. Why did I get a different value in the other class? Let me see here. Do, 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 do. Oh, what did I get 88 for? Y'all give me just a second. I want to I want to investigate. Who did I teach that to yesterday? I taught that to maybe was it? No, it wasn't. Them. 13 times 6. I want, oh, oh, I'm going to kick that kid's booty. Uh, I, I asked the class yesterday, and I said, hey, what's 13 times 6? And he said 88. Is 13 times 6 88? No. What a goober. I'm the goober. I'm, I should have verified. I should have said, does anyone concur with 6 times 8? Uh, I'm, I'll have to yell at him this afternoon, and then I'll get back with you guys on Thursday and tell you how, how that shook out. But uh, this is about 3% of the time, right? So this is about 0.0294. Okay, so that's about uh, about three 
percent of the time. Now, let me check your common sense. Can I check your common sense real quick? Okay. Common sense says that that occurs 3% of the time means that if I did this experiment with Alex a hundred different times, right? Say, Alex, fan it out, draw a couple cards, we record the results, shuffle them back together. Hey, Alex, draw a couple cards, record the results, shuffle them back together. If I did that a hundred times, what would the result be as far as his ability to draw out a pair of cards? Jack? Mathematically speaking, he should get a pair of cards three times. Is he guaranteed to get a pair of cards three times? No. Could he get a pair of cards every time? Yes. That means that that is possible. But is that probable? No. It is not probable because the probability is very low, relatively speaking. OK, so it is possible but not probable and let's say that i ran that experiment 100 times with my man alex up here and let's say that of those 100 times 99 of them he resulted in him drawing a pair number one i'd say let's I'm, you're a pretty lucky guy next time i'm playing cards let's get together and you can be my partner all right but but how could i get it to where the number worked itself to three percent what would i need to do in order to make those numbers work Think common sense. I do my experiment a hundred times with him. Maybe do it more. Maybe do it a thousand times or a million times or a billion times. In other words, eventually the average would come down to what? It would come down to 3%. Have you ever played basketball and and it gotten like on fire and like just started hitting all your free throws, just a free throw hitting machine, right? Okay. And and let's say let's say I'm a 75% a free throw shooter. Okay. I'm not, but let's say I am. If I go into a game and I shoot four free throws, am I guaranteed to hit three? No. Maybe I hit all four of them. Maybe, like I said, I'm hot and, and I hit my first uh, you know, a buttload of them. As the season goes on, I will eventually start missing and my number will go back down to my, my normal, my normal average. So in other words, if I increase the sample space, then my probability will get closer to reality. All right. Any questions about drawing a pair or cards or anything like that? I know this is a weird topic. Go ahead, Quentin. Uh, because a 10 of hearts and a 10 of diamonds is no different than a 10 of diamonds and a 10 of hearts. So like these two right here aren't unique. And so I don't want to count them twice. So if I said four times three, that the number of uh, four times three is 12. Those 12 would contain uh, repeats. They would contain six of them lined up the orange way and six of them lined up the green way. So I divide by two to kill off the, the repeats. All right. Uh, and again, you don't have to worry about that kind of thought process until uh, until algebra two. I'm still sort of yeah, you know, we're still operating in brute force mode, if you will. Now, um, we've talked about tools and I want to introduce another tool to you as far as uh, what helps us count. You've got your fundamental principle of counting. Yes. OK, but we can also have a visual tool to help us count things. And I'm a visual guy. You guys know this at this point. Hey, Harlan. And, and so what I would do is, and we're about to start rolling dice, Harlem. You you want to be a dice roller for a moment? All right, show me show me some skills here. We're going to have Harlem roll right up there against the wall. Harlem's going to roll with my pair of dice. What'd you roll? A nine. Beautiful. Thank you. So well, let's figure out what how many ways would there be for somebody to roll a couple of dice and to get a nine? Okay. So right off the top of your head, he rolled it. Would you roll a six and a three? So that's one way. Could you come up with another way to get a nine? Paul? Four and a five. Four and a five. Good. Jack? Four and a five. Six and a three. Are those the only two ways? Yeah. Bro? Uh, wait, a nine? A seven and a two. So there's not a seven on my die. So so we we've, we've outlined it, but um I'm going to show you a picture you undercounted. Did I tell you that was the warning that you would undercount? 
Right, so check this out. This is what's called a lattice diagram. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So like my first die, that first die that Harlem rolled is my bottom axis. The second die that Harlem rolled is my is vertical axis, my second axis. Check this out. Um, uh, real quick, I'm going to make some dots just to have a visual thing to show you. So there's going to be 36 of these dots all together. And what was the number that we were shooting for here, fellas? A nine. And, and I warned you we would probably undercount. So Harlem rolled, let's say he rolled a six and a three. And then I think Reed or somebody had told me a five uh, and a four. Are there any other ways to get a six, uh, to get a uh, to get a nine? What do you think, Jack? A four and a five. And a three and a six. So there's four ways. Right. Uh, and I know on my problem I wrote seven, but since Harlem's in here, we did a we did a nine and that's fine, too. Uh, so we'll say a nine. So there's four ways for us to. Now, I've had students argue with me before, say, dang, coach, uh, a roll in a five and a four is no different than a roll in a four and a five. Harlem, can you read what's on that die on the six face? Those dice came from a casino. What they do on a casino die is they stamp a serial number on it. Uh, William, we're not ready for class yet, bub. <laughs> uh, they stamp a serial number on it. So this is a very different five and four is very different than four and five. All right. So your probability, what is that going to be? Four over 36 is one night. Is that right? So if Harlem did his experiment nine times on the average, he would hit. Why is it lagging so bad? Uh, on the average, he would hit, uh, he would roll his nine one out of nine times. Why don't you do the probability of, a, of rolling a seven? That's what I had written up there originally. Why don't you do the probability of rolling a seven, and we'll see what we get there. You ever learned any of this? You might next year. Who are you taking next year? You don't know. Maybe Coach Dollar or maybe Coach Gray, one of those two, I would imagine. Y'all might do a little bit of probability, play a little cards. I'll see you then. All right, good. How many ways is there to roll a seven? Have you looked at your picture yet? Your lattice diagram? Seven, by the way, is the most common sum when you're rolling two dice. How many ways is there? Has anybody counted them yet? Call it out. Yeah, there's six ways to do it. There's 36 ways to do anything, okay? So, like, check this out. Here they are. A one and a six, a two and a five, a three and a four, a four and a three, a five and a two, a six and a one. So there's six ways to do my event. Again, there's 36 ways to do anything. So the probability here is one six. Which am I more likely to roll? A sum that adds up to nine or a sum that adds up to seven? seven. A sum that adds up to seven because there's more ways to do it. What is the, the, I mean, how, how can I phrase this question? Which sum would have the lowest probability? A 12 or a or a 2. Good. So snake eyes or double sixes, right? Now in the earlier, or not in the earlier class, yesterday in, in the afternoon class, they said, well, wait, 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 wait. You're just as likely to roll snake eyes as you are to roll uh, two twos. And I said, that is very true, right? The probability of rolling snake eyes and the probability of rolling a pair of twos uh, is the same, right? But when we're, we're talking about the sum of two numbers, two plus two is four. So there's other ways to get a four besides just snake eyes. So we're talking about, um, where'd my dice go? We're talking about the sum of those. Now, what would the probability be that I roll a, a 13? That I roll a 13 with these two die? It'd be a zero probability. And that's kind of trivial, isn't it? Right? It's like, well, uh, okay, you can't do that. What's the probability that I roll a one? zero okay i mean i'm not going to roll both of these die and then there's not it, one of them is not going to disappear and i just count the one that's not possible but again that's trivial okay um what's the probability that i roll um a number that is greater than one a hundred percent i'm guaranteed on t when i roll these two die to roll a number that a sum that is greater than one 
Okay, that's 100. But again, that's trivial. So remember, what is our probability always between? Zero and one. All right, so we've got our, uh, a nice little picture way of visualizing with a lattice diagram. Uh, we talked about our fundamental principle of counting. Um, why don't you guys try one on your own? The probability of flipping, the, so here's, here's what I'm gonna do. I got two events, this will be our last example today. I'm gonna flip a coin and I'm gonna roll my die and I wanna know what is the probability that I flip the coin to heads and I roll the die to where it's a number that's greater than four. It's a number that's greater than four. So I flip my coin and I roll my die and what's the probability that it is a heads and it is greater than four? Jack, you got an answer? One six. One six, all right, let's see if anybody concurs with Jack. Now I've given you a picture, oh, by the way, on the screen, a nice lattice diagram to help as needed. Does anybody concur with one sixth? Jack, you got something different? You concur? Okay, good. All right, let's see how that comes about. So first of all, rolling a heads or flipping a heads and rolling a number that's greater than four means that does four work? No, we said greater than. So five would work, six would work. There's twelve possibilities two of which would get the job done. So my probability is one sixth. All right, very good. Doesn't that lattice diagram make it super easy, right? Now here's where it becomes a little bit more challenging. If there's more than two events, right? I, I could break into three dimensions if there were three events, but that would be hard to draw out, okay? Um, and, and so the, the lattice diagram is nice for some simple examples that are uh, easily drawable in two dimensions. Right. But hey, great class today, fellas. I have put up, listen to me, I put up some basic um, problems on Delta Math, some practice problems for you to work through. Please log on to Delta Math, give those a look, and then we'll discuss more of this on Thursday, okay? In the meantime, live Jesus in our hearts, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I have a question. So yesterday was our last full day of school, and we had to turn in our Chromebooks, and I had my login information for Delta Math saved down in there. So I can look really, it up for you. May, okay, yeah. But shoot, I shoot me an email, and I'll reply right. to your email with your with your login info. All right. Or I'll ask my parents because I tried to send an email to uh, cbhs.com, but I think it's uh, yeah, uh, dot org. Oh, dot org. Okay. Yeah. That's so Morgan at cbhs.org. Thank you, Quentin. See you, buddy. All right, y'all have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Take care.